Excited Utterance, the Evidence and Proof Podcast, Episode 137, Deborah Denno, Neuroscience Evidence in Criminal Cases. Welcome to Excited Utterance. I'm your host, Ed Chang from Vanderbilt Law School. Excited Utterance is your podcast for cutting edge scholarship and developments in the world of evidence. We bring virtual workshops to you throughout the academic year. This week, our guest is Debbie Denno. Debbie is the Arthur McGivney Professor of Law at Fordham University School of Law, where she is also founding director of the Neuroscience and Law Center. Among other things, Debbie teaches criminal law, criminal procedure, and law and neuroscience, and is a well-known scholar in all of those fields. Our podcast today features her new article, How Experts Have Dominated the Neuroscience Narrative in Criminal Cases for 12 Decades, a Warning for the Future. It was published last year in the William & Mary Law Review. In it, Debbie reports on an extensive project in which she examines the use of neuroscience in criminal cases over the last 120 years. These days, When we talk about the use of neuroscientific evidence in criminal cases, I think we often think about brain imaging technology that's used to determine insanity or some form of mental incapacity. But Debbie's work suggests that this imaging technology is just the tip of the iceberg. Historically, of course, imaging technology didn't exist. But even today, Cases tend to be more about testifying experts and their opinions, and only sometimes about the diagnostic tests that they use, and then far less about the brain scan images. My discussion with Debbie takes a look at how neuroscientific evidence really plays out in practice and considers its influence, for better or for worse, on the criminal justice system. Debbie, delighted to have you on Excited Utterance. Welcome. Thank you so much, Ed. At the core of your new article is a rather monumental empirical project that features 12 decades of cases from 1900 to 2020 and potentially over 8,000 cases. So to get us started, can you give us a brief overview of the project? What got you started on it? And what did you hope to discover or learn from it? I started this project quite a while ago, as you can imagine. And I started it for a number of reasons. First of all, people in the area of neuroscience and law were always discussing the same few cases that got a lot of publicity with the flamboyant defendants. And I was interested in how's the criminal justice system really operating with the standard criminal defendant. And then I looked at two decades worth of cases from 1992 to 2012, but discovered that, you know, it wasn't providing me with the sample sizes I needed or the perspective. So that's why I went back to 1900. And as you might guess, it made sense to go forward up to the present time to get a full view of what's happening with this evidence in the criminal justice system. How has it changed or not changed? And how really does it operate on the day-to-day level? To our listeners, I think the immediate objection or limitation that would spring to mind is the fact that the study only involved published cases, which, of course, have their pluses and minuses. Now, I should temper this by saying that, to me, data limitations are an inevitable part of any empirical study. But presumably, you thought about these trade-offs. So perhaps you can say a bit more about why you chose to use a published case data set and why the study remains important despite the limitation that you used only published cases. You're absolutely right that there are vast limitations with using Westlaw and Lexis as data set. I do think the strengths outweigh the limitations. I mean, first of all, Neuroscience is used throughout the criminal justice system. There are tons of cases 
where I'm unaware that it's being used. So to try to look for those in the next maybe three decades, I'd be successful in doing that. But of course, that's pretty impossible. So I went to these published data sources. On the one hand, anybody can get access to this data and they can validate or criticize me based on it. This is not a hidden data source. And I think that's very important. Number two is that I can provide and substantiate everything I say. So for every law review article that I've published on this data set, I will hand to the law students a whole appendix of cases that validate everything that the students can then check. And I think that's important. Otherwise, nobody could go out and really do this separately. I'd like to drill down on a couple of key evidentiary findings in the study. The first is that you found that expert testimony was basically always involved in presenting neuroscience evidence in cases involving insanity and diminished capacity. And only sometimes did these cases involve what you call non-imaging tests, these psychological tests that don't involve actual images. I think it was something like a third of cases had that And then only very rarely did cases involve the actual neuroscience imaging that we're all familiar with. And I think that was something like a tenth of cases had that kind of imaging evidence. In a sense, I think you suggest that a lot of the scholarly focus is barking up the wrong tree, that we focus on the flashy new technology, the imaging stuff rather than on more fundamental issues involving experts. Can you tell us more about that thought? Why are we focused on the imaging? And why is it important to focus on the experts? Yeah, I think this is a major discovery in the study. I think we focus on the imaging because that's what interests people. That's the most controversial aspect of this kind of research. It is peculiar to me every time I talk about this research and emphasize the fact that it's really dominated by expert testimony that doesn't rely on any kind of testing whatsoever. At the end of the day, everybody just reverts to talking about the imaging. And this is one of many reasons why I did the project that I'm doing. I think there are many myths associated with having neuroscientific evidence in the criminal justice system. And this is one of those myths. Do you think that some of it may be a language issue so that when we say neuroscience, we tend to think of fMRI imaging technology, whereas, for example, if we say psychology, then we might think of more traditional expert testimony on insanity or mental illness or any of those kinds of issues? Part of this could be definitional. I have a very broad definition of what neuroscience constitutes. I define it as the branch of life. Sciences that studies the brain and the nervous system, that's a pretty accepted definition. And so when people focus on the imaging, they think that's neuroscience and they see that synonymously. The other evidentiary finding, which I found particularly fascinating, and perhaps it's because it relates to my own work, is that you found that defendants often succeed getting appellate courts to overturn their convictions on insanity grounds when they effectively can demonstrate an expert consensus in their favor. And in fact, I think what's really interesting is that the appellate courts acknowledge that the juries can disregard the experts. The jury instructions all say you do not need to actually believe or credit the expert testimony. But at the same time, the appellate courts are saying that effectively no rational jury can go against an expert consensus. Maybe you can talk a little bit more about that. Am I reading that right? And more broadly, what's the role of consensus in this area? Is consensus effectively the de facto rule that governs the insanity defense then? 
You're making some excellent points here and driving from these insanity cases. They are confronted by a defense versus expert adversarial process. So when you do have experts agree with one another, it does have a powerful role in the system. And I think juries rely very heavily on that. So I do think it's a good way of looking at it and saying that it is a de facto influence here on juries. So in many of these cases, I think you may have conflicting experts, and then you have classic battle of the expert problems. I am somewhat surprised that you have cases where you have what the appellate court suggests is expert consensus on insanity, and yet the prosecution and, in fact, the trial court ends up convicting the defendant anyway, contrary to the expert consensus. That seems somewhat surprising to me. I think it goes to the power of how strong this adversarial process is. It comes out or we see it even more clearly with neuroscientific evidence. That's number one. Number two, the expert consensus really comes about in these cases where the defendant is acting so that it's really hard for prosecution experts to say anything except that the defendant was acting in a matter that would satisfy the insanity defense. So in many of these insanity cases where there is this consensus, the defendant acting in the policeman at the elbow scenario, one case is cutting off the victim's head right when the police are standing there. So that's where you get the consensus. But number two, I think you're really raising a powerful point about the criminal justice system. Despite this consensus, despite these extreme insanity cases where it's just very clear that something problematic is going on here, that the prosecution is still wanting to convict the defendant. And as we know, a lot of these cases are death penalty cases. It's very interesting. The cases that you offer up as examples do seem really quite exceptionally extreme. And I think in those cases, you end up with expert consensus in the defendant's favor on insanity. And then you have an appellate court actually stepping in and changing the result. Two questions that in a way extend beyond the specific paper that we're talking about, but I want to get your thoughts on given the study and your familiarity with the cases in the study. The first question is, you don't talk much about Daubert in the paper, but since Daubert was decided in 1993, I would expect that it would play at least some role in these cases, if not an outsized role. What's the effect of Daubert on all of this? It's a great question. With the kind of evidence that I was examining, it does come up, but it's infrequent. And most of this evidence gets by the Daubert standard. Why? I mean, uh, even the expert testimony does, but also the non-imaging testimony, like the psychometric tests. Most of the testing that's introduced is pretty much established and accepted by the scientific community, and it's not all that controversial. Interesting. So in many ways, the conventional wisdom, which is that Daubert had a lot more bite in the civil context and not so much bite in the criminal context, rears up again so that effectively, even though you have Daubert showing up, it's not really used to remove the experts in these cases. That's right. And given that half of my cases are death penalty cases and the neuroscientific evidence is coming in as mitigation in that kind of context in the penalty phase, the evidentiary standards are different there anyway. The other evidentiary question I had that's a bit of an extension is, although you talk a bunch about the effect of the Hinckley trial, I recall that Hinckley resulted in a modification of the federal rules of evidence under 704B. And basically that amendment banned experts from testifying about whether a defendant had or did not have the correct mental state. What effect did that amendment have on the introduction of neuroscience evidence? Ed, that's a great question. It's something that I'll have to investigate. I haven't looked at that. So that could be an interesting avenue of further inquiry. Absolutely. No, you just gave me a great idea. I'll credit you with that, of course, but I I have some work to do on that front. Finally, I wanted to 
push you on an intriguing thing that you raise in the paper, but I think only touch on and then leave. So you open the article with a framing involving the Phineas Gage case. And there you kind of suggest that despite neuroscience being a science, a lot of the influence of neuroscience in the courtroom has to do with the narrative or the characterizations that experts provide. In some ways, I think that that framing gets a little lost once the article gets into the empirical data. And I think that's because the empirical data is so interesting. Can you tell us more about that framing? What were you worried about in bringing up Phineas Gage and this concern over expert narrative? Well, first of all, I think you're right that the Phineas Gage case and the framework surrounding it gets lost in the empirical narrative. And I'd like to extend Phineas Gage in future work. What concerned me about the case is that you have this powerful story that takes on really inaccurate dimensions for decades to come and has a strong negative effect on the science that follows it, as well as the law. And I can see that potentially happening with other kinds of cases. And a prime example of that is the John Hinckley 1982 case, where he's found to be insane, has a massive effect on what happens later, both legally and psychologically in this country in terms of what can be introduced as evidence, et cetera. So I think this is all to say is that these discrete cases have more power and impact than we can imagine, that Phineas Gage wasn't just a fluke, that we see this later on, and that we need to be concerned about these kinds of effects. And just for our listeners, so the Phineas Gage case is the famous case, I think it's Civil War, where a soldier has a piece of shrapnel embedded in his brain, but it doesn't kill the soldier. And so the personality changes, or at least the alleged personality changes, suggest that different parts of the brain have different effects on our ability to reason or think. Debbie, to your point, in some ways, I think sometimes these celebrity trials, Phineas Gage not being a celebrity trial, but my general view on celebrity trials and evidence is that I'm always worried that these single one-off cases with bizarre facts or very strange things going on at trial ends up coloring the way that we think about evidence law, even though that's not how evidence law actually works in practice for the vast majority of other cases out there. One of many reasons I'm doing the project on all cases in the criminal justice system, looking at neuroscientific evidence from 1900 to 2020 is because of this focus on celebrity cases and how much they distort people's views of what kind of evidence should come in and what kind of evidence they think is coming into the criminal justice system. By looking at sort of the standard everyday case, I'm trying to improve upon the kinds of myths that we all seem to follow. Final question for you. What's next for you on this project? Presumably there is more to extract from the data set that you've constructed. Or are there things that you'd like other people to follow up on? For this project right now, I'm writing a book. I'm looking at earlier cases and following through from the 1900s all the way to 2020. So I'm trying to give a broader historical overview of what's been happening in the criminal system and also neuroscientific evidence. Number two is I would love if other people could look at the more standard non-celebrity cases. I think altogether, we could learn a little bit more about the criminal justice system and how it really operates. Well, Debbie, thanks for taking the time to talk to us about neuroscience evidence and its effect over time on criminal cases. I very much look forward to your book when it is completed. Great having you on the show. Thanks for the invitation, Ed. As we discussed in the interview, Studies of published case law have their limitations and caveats. In criminal law, the case law obviously hides the overwhelming majority of cases, which are largely resolved by plea bargaining. But case law also has a heavily appellate cast, 
which further skews the perspective. That said, as Debbie notes, published case law is both accessible and transparent, and it can offer new perspectives and generate new avenues for future inquiry. And this is particularly so when the effects that we observe are in the direction that is opposite to what we might expect from the selection bias. For example, you'd think that the brain imaging cases would be the high profile cases that go to trial and are subsequently appealed. Maybe imaging is so successful that those cases result in acquittals or plea bargains, but it's still curious that the published record seems to offer very few imaging cases and certainly fewer imaging cases than we might expect. And Debbie's results certainly suggest that we should be paying way more attention to expert testimony or expert opinion in this space than we have of late. Another intriguing result, which we touched on in the interview, are these cases involving expert psychological consensus. In the article, Debbie catalogs several cases in which an appellate court overturns a conviction because there's an assemblage of often three or four experts who align on the defendant's side to support the insanity defense. Now, the jury instructions in this space are typically quite clear. Jurors are free to disbelieve and disregard expert testimony. But perhaps that's not really the case in practice when there is an emerging expert consensus. And then there's the question, why did the jury and the trial court in these cases depart from the consensus? Why did they choose to strike off on their own? These are all questions that deserve a further look. Finally, we didn't have time to explore this issue, but Debbie hints in the paper that in the future, we might see a move away from an emphasis on individual expert testimony and toward more objective psychological tests. I'd like to hear more about why she thinks that's the case and whether that change would be driven by the demands of courts or based on the internal dynamics of the expert communities themselves. In any event, I look forward to hearing more about this prediction as well as future insights from this amazing database on neuroscience in criminal cases. Support for Excited Utterance is generously provided by Vanderbilt Law School's Brentstetter Litigation and Dispute Resolution Program and the University of Arkansas School of Law. The associate producer is Alex Nunn, and the production editor is Madeline DiPietro. Additional production assistance is provided by Kyra Hammond, and the music is provided by the Vanderbilt University Blair School of Music's Children's Cello Choir under the direction of Kirsten Castle Greer. I'm your host, Ed Chang, and I hope you'll join us again next time when we take on another new work in the world of evidence and proof. <laughs>